Live with CDP Sports Talk, a weekly sports and entertainment podcast sponsored by Barry Cullen Chevrolet. Live on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, and LinkedIn. And on audio via Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, Anchor FM, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Radio Public, and TuneIn. Now, here's your host, Chris Palme. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 5, Overall 390 of Live with CDP Sports Talk, sponsored by Barry Cullen Chevrolet Dealership at 905 Woodlawn Road West in the Guelph Automall. Check out barrycollin.com for the newest selection of new and pre-owned GM vehicles, or give them a call at 519-824-0210. Tom Chris Pame sent you, or you can email the dealership at info at barrycollin.com. As always, Live with CDP Sports Talk is on weeknights from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern on radio station CKRT, Border City Radio in Windsor, playing the best soft music of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I'm also on WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, the home of Southern Talk and Sports, weeknights from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. as well. I hope everyone's doing well on this Tuesday, April 16th, 2024, and I'm really excited about my guest today. This is her first time on my show, the first time I've ever interviewed a boxer, and her name is Mia St. John. She's a, She is a five-time women's boxing world champion, a mental health advocate, and an author, author of her recent book, Fighting for My Life, a memoir, a memoir about a mother's loss in grief, which is currently now available, and I'm going to bring on her guest, Mia St. John. Good morning, Hi. Mia. How are you? Hi. Good morning. I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving me some time out of your busy schedule to come on here today. Oh, thank you for having me. How's the weather right now in California? Oh, it's nice and warm and sunny. Nice and warm and sunny. Yeah, you did. You, did, you guys did get a little bit of rain. Yeah, yeah, we did. My last guest on from California, a couple of actors, uh, when they came on live with me, they had an earthquake. So I'm like, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but um, congratulations on your latest book um, that just came out, a memoir about a mother's loss and, and grief. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about your latest book? Yeah, I wrote that book um, uh few years after I lost my son to suicide um, and then I lost his father um, due to alcoholism uh, over the grief of our son and I didn't know how to what to do with myself how to express my grief how to um, to move forward in life and so I just sat down and just started writing all my feelings and, and my agent, uh, my literary agent said, uh, let's put it in a, in a memoir and, uh, try and help other, other people going through the same thing. And so that's what I did and got a deal with Simon and Schuster and published the book. Did you find writing the book kind of helped a little bit as well? By oh, it was very, very cathartic. Yes. And um, right now, if somebody's watching and listening to our show, where can they, uh, what's the best place to, pop, to buy your book, purchase it? Um, well, the easiest place, um, it's in bookstores, but you can go to Amazon. And there's also a... Um, uh, Oh, my mind just went blank. You can listen to it or on you audio. can really read it. Yeah, I guess so audio. I did, I did audio. Yes, audio. Thank you. Yeah, I did an audio version. This technology is amazing, by the way. 
yeah nowadays and, and like i said without technology i wouldn't be doing what i'm doing now i'm working on a new career into radio at the age of 52 and uh i just love doing this and uh again i want to say thank you for coming on here as well and uh you did another book recently too i think uh the knockout uh workout as well that one was that was my first book that came out i think in 2010 and that's more of a fitness book health and fitness Okay, I should look at it as well because I'm in the process of uh, trying to lose weight and eat healthier as well. And uh, being a boxer, can you just explain to us how important uh, fitness, nutrition, and cardio was in, t in terms of your boxing career? Oh, it was so important. Um, it was everything. I had to make sure that I felt good. And to feel good, you have to eat right. And, and obviously to be in the sport that we're in, you know, what we eat is, is vital. Absolutely. And uh, can you tell me, my show is based out of the Toronto area. So you can you just tell my audience just a little bit about yourself. And uh, when did you start taking an interest in, in, in boxing back in the mid nineties? Well, actually what people don't know is that I, I had been fighting for many years. I started in Taekwondo when I was six and I competed in that sport for many years. I wanted to be a boxer in the late 70s when I saw Rocky Balboa. <laughs> yes, my favorite movie, by the way. Sylvester yes. Stallone, favorite movie. Yes, favorite movie. And um, so, but once I saw Christy Martin doing it on the Tyson cards, I was like, hey, I can do that. Anyway, long story short, short I ended up signing with Bob Arum and opening for Oscar De La Hoya so I was like the opposite of Christy where she was the big and burly brute you know I was the golden girl <laughs> so and open for golden boy Taekwondo uh, I guess it, it, it helped impact you a lot what was it like uh, being awarded a black belt and um, when you did first break into boxing from that, um, how many female boxers were there at the time? And, and how much has it changed over the years for female boxers? Well, I, I don't know how many female boxers there were. I mean, thousands, you know. Uh, I, I don't know. All across the world, there were many female fighters. Um, we just didn't get recognition until the 90s. Um, when I started opening on the HBO pay-per-view cards and Christy Martin was on the Showtime pay-per-view cards, that's when we got noticed. But, you know, there were thousands that were boxing long before us. Did you have any um, female boxers that were like sort of like mentors or influences in your career, Mia, when you were starting out? Um, no, because at the time, uh, that I started, women weren't really allowed in the gyms. Um, and when we were, there were so few women, there were mostly men. So I had mostly met male mentors. And, um, when you went to school, uh, how important was education and uh, how, do, how does education affect mental health as well? Well, the education was important because I was first generation born in America. My mother came from Mexico and, you know, she brought us here to, to be educated and to have a better opportunity. And so before I went, went pro in boxing, she said I had to get a degree in something. So I chose psychology and uh, got my degree. And then I turned pro. My next question I was going to ask you, I guess, is um, when you turned pro, how important was it to find a good manager in training when you were starting out? It was very important because you had to make sure that you could trust the manager not to throw you under the bus, you know. Um, 
you wanted to be the one that was winning, not the one that was losing, the one that was getting paid to lose. You wanted to be the one getting paid to win. So it was very important to have a manager that you trusted. How competitive was the industry when, especially when you first brought, brought broken in Mia? Um, you know, we were, a lot of us females were very green at the time. Um, nowadays it's a lot different. The sport has evolved and you see women that pretty much fight as good as the men, but that wasn't the case in, when I was fighting, we were, like I said, very green and we're just starting out. So, um, the competition wasn't as fierce as it is today. Since you retired, Mia, in 2017 after a 20-year career, um, do you still follow the sport often? Um, I do on occasion. You know, I I still, um, you know, go to some of the fights, the big male fights. Um, and, you know, I kind of peek in just to see what's going on. and But I'm still very much a part of the WBC. Um, I'll be signing uh, May 4th uh, before the Canelo fight at Box Fan Expo. And you'll get to see all the big fighters there like Tyson Holyfield. Um, Floyd Mayweather goes there. So you'll get to see all of us there and get a signed picture or memorabilia. That's awesome. Now, in your career, Mia, did you ever, um, obviously you boxed in the States, but did you ever box in other countries? And, and did you have any fights in Canada as well? Well, yeah, my titles, I'm a five-time world champion, and that says it all, world. So, well, true. yeah, so you do, we fought it. I fought in Germany, China, Canada, Mexico, um, Oh my God, I could go on and on. Uh, Sweden, um, I mean, yeah, Japan, uh, yeah. I should, I should have. I apologize. I should have reworded the question. Wh what were some of your favorite? What was your favorite country that you uh, fought in outside of the states? Oh God, my favorite had to be probably Germany or China. Uh, and it so memorable. And uh, who were some of your toughest opponents in your in your career? I'd have to say Cecilia Brickhouse was my toughest opponent. But at the time, she was, you know, she was in her prime and I was already in my retirement days. So I would have loved to have fought her when I was in my prime. One thing I wanted to ask you as well, because I'm still learning about boxing, um, how much has the UFC taken away from boxing? Are you do you feel the sport of boxing is still going strong in 2024? It's definitely still going strong. Um, look, the UFC is is great, um, but they're still not making the money that that our top boxers are. I mean, look at Floyd Mayweather, like, you know, he was making $50 million. There's no one in the UFC that can compare to Floyd Mayweather. I mean, there's, there's no way. And right now, currently for female boxers, who would you say would be the top bo uh, female boxer out there? Oh, there's, there's so many of them. You have Amanda Serrano, you have, um, uh, that my mind's drawing a blank. Hey, help it, happens. Me out. it happens. Um, I guess I could also word it too. Is if, if you could go back in time or you could get back in the ring now, is there somebody that you'd like to participate, like fight against, go against? Um, no, there's really, um, 
No, because it's it's so unfair now. You know, the type the fighters, like I said, have evolved and they're they they fight just like the men. So it wouldn't be a fair fight. Um you know, they're just it's just completely different nowadays. And this leads to my next question, Mia. How did you end up with Art Lovett along with his brother and eventually signing a contract with the legendary Don King in top rank boxing? Well, my what happened was um, I wrote a letter to Don King before I turned pro in boxing and sent a picture and said, I want to turn pro. And he called my manager two weeks later and flew us out to Florida and we signed a deal and I turned pro. Where and then I left him. I left on King a year later for Bob Arum so I could open for Oscar De La Hoya. What was Don King like to deal with? Were you a little intimidating um, at first when you met him? Yeah. I mean, you know, he was a great promoter. He wasn't as good as Bob Arum, um, but he was, he was definitely one of the top promoters. And how important is it, I guess, to have a really good promoter, especially when you're an upcoming boxer? It's, it's key. I mean, because they can put you on TV. They can expose you to the world. Now, I've always wanted to ask a boxer this, too. When you have your opponents, do you have a say in choosing your opponent? Or is it up to the, prom the promoter to choose your opponents? The matchmaker chooses the opponents. But if you're a top fighter and they're building you up, you have a lot of say and you, you have all the say pretty much. When preparing for an opponent, Mia, um, what's the process like? Uh, it's very intense. It's weeks of conditioning and weight training. You know what? I have to put you on. I have to close my camera. How do I do that? Uh, you just can close it off. If you go up here, there's a little where you're. Okay, that's oh. it. Yeah. You can stay on audio too if you'd like. Uh, I should have told you that you can come on camera or you can come on audio as well. Oh, okay. So whatever you're comfortable with. I always uh, try to do my best to accommodate my guests. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. All right. Um, I was going to say also, you probably watch a lot of video film too of the, your uh, opponent coming up. Uh, yes. Yeah, definitely watch videos. Um, I'm sorry, I got distracted. I have someone here. No worries. Absolutely no worries. All right, guys, uh, just uh, just talking to Mia St. John, uh, five-time women's world champion in boxing. And uh, we'll just hopefully we'll get it back in hey, a minute or so. Back. You're back. You're back. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Hey, I've learned to ab-lib and uh, I've learned to keep going. So I'm a talker. Yeah. But I, I was going to I was gonna say, oh, I guess with boxing now, too, social media has kind of changed the game, too, as well. Yeah, you know, we didn't have social media back in the 90s, so it definitely makes a huge difference um, with the fighters today. They're very lucky they have social media today. What did you love the most about the sport of boxing, and what were some of the hardest aspects of it? Oh, I loved the the crowd, the cameras, the thrill of of fighting. I mean, it was so such an adrenaline rush, you know, and I definitely miss that part of it. I'll always miss that part of it. Also, um, I guess the wrestling started this back in the eighties. Uh, I guess back in the nineties, did you have an intro song to come out to? Yeah. We, uh, every fight I came out to a different song. Okay. And what were some of your favorites? Oh, I came out to a lot of Selena songs. 
Um, gosh, I can't even remember. ACDC. I had a lot of songs I came out to. Amazing. And um, for, as being a professional boxer too, how important was it to, to pick out your colors and, and, and your for your trunks and stuff like that, your gear? Well, people know me for my pink. I always wore hot pink in the ring. Um, usually, I mean, that was my signature color. What were your thoughts on your first boxing match against Angelica Villain? And uh, at the time of your debate, uh, debut, your first match in 1997, and uh, you already answered, or we already talked about the last question. So just thoughts on your first ever match with her. Uh, obviously, it only lasted 54 seconds, but were you a little bit nervous going in the ring for the first time professionally? I was so scared. I wanted to run out of the dressing room. I was in tears. It was so stressful, but the adrenaline rush just took over everything and and it was so worth it did you have any rituals or superstitions before a match uh no we always prayed as a group together before the fight um that was a ritual that we had um but yeah no superstitions <laughs> And out of all your matches, which one was your, I guess, your quickest match, or and which one was your longest uh, going the full distance? Um, well, I went the distance many times. Um, my shortest fight was probably my pro debut, Angelica Vion, uh, which lasted 54 seconds. But I, I went the distance with a lot of fights. I'm going to put you on the spot with this question. If you you had one word to describe yourself as a boxer, what would that word be? Great. <laughs> I was great. I wasn't the best, um, but I was great. I was a damn good boxer. Well, obviously, boxing is a physical sport. How important was it to have a strong mindset uh, while, while training, preparing, and then getting into the, the ring with your opponents? Oh, it was, it was very important. I had to meditate before every fight. And um, I practiced meditation a lot throughout my training. And how important was it having a strong support system with, with family and friends too at the time? Very important. I had a strong team, a team that I trusted and um, was very close to at all times. Now, when, when you were fighting, how often did you have a fight on the average, like once a month or every couple of months? How did that work? I was fighting every month for a long time. Um, and then towards the end of my career, it got less and less. And uh, you had a 20-year career. Generally, that that's a, that's a ver very long time in one sport for 20 years, two decades. Uh, it was very long, yes. From your first match in 1997 to your last match in 2017, what would you say, how did you evolve as a boxer over those 20 years? Well, I got better as the years went on, you know, um, because when I first started, you know, I was in Taekwondo. I was a kicker. I wasn't really a puncher. So, but I evolved over the years. How much did that in, impact your boxing career and, and it helped you? Uh, how much did... Taekwondo, like how oh, much... With building your self-confidence? It gave me the mindset to fight, you know, to be in a crowd and to put your life on the line in, in front of thousands of people, you know, it, 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 helped my mindset for sure and who were some of your trainers in taekwondo uh pd cunningham mark para um Vern villelamy um yeah okay <laughs> 
All right. Uh, Mia, if you're still good for time, I was just going to ask you uh, one or two more boxing questions and then just a, a few more after that. I uh, wanted to ask you this one. How much of an impact did Eduardo and Roberto Garcia make on your boxing career in terms of learning the proper punching techniques, the footwork, and the defensive strategies? Uh, well, they, they changed my whole uh style of boxing i was very aggressive in the beginning i was very offensive and they made me very defensive and i had at one point in my boxing career i was probably the best defensive boxer there was have you ever thought about getting back into boxing as a trainer or a coach or anything like that or a mentor never i train right now um uh, people in a mental health facility that are suffering from homelessness, addiction, mental illness. Um, I do that um, for charity, but I would never actually uh, go back and, and train a, a fighter. And the last question about your boxing career, how difficult was it to announce your retirement from boxing and your and facing your last opponent, I believe she was Lisa Lewis. Yeah, it was very difficult. I didn't want to retire, but I had to. Just because of the, I guess, because of the physical, the physical toll boxing takes on you. Well, and we're not equipped to to fight anymore at that age you know your reflexes are slow you can see the punches coming you just can't move out of the way quick enough so it's very dangerous to fight at, at that age okay mia can you just tell us about being a, a mental health advocate and how has it affected yourself your family and many others yeah i you know i lost my son to suicide he had schizophrenia and um i suffer from an anxiety disorder called gad and my daughter has mental illness so uh, and her father was bipolar so i definitely speak out on mental health and the importance of being educated we must start to be educated on on mental illness absolutely and uh I, I and wanted you can, to, read, you can read more uh, at miastjohnfoundation.org. And I have that website down here as well. I just wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit more about that. Did you find uh, mental health issues have even increased during and after the pandemic? And how can uh, the government, uh, not just in the States, but around the world, help people struggling with mental health issues and homelessness? Homelessness. Being in Canada, I find mental health issues have increased, and I'm, we're seeing more and more people homelessness as well. Yeah, I don't know if it's increased or we're just becoming more aware of it. Because I, I know with some people, uh, everyone says talking helps, but I think just as important as talking with somebody that's dealing with mental health issues is listening to them as well. Yeah, listening and being able to find the right help, the right medication, the, you know, the right doctors. Absolutely. And uh, for someone that's watching this live right now or later on audio and, they, and they're currently having mental health issues, Mia, what would you what advice would you give to them? To contact NAMI.org, N-A-M-I dot org. Thank you for it's, doing it's, it's worldwide. Because I know for two years, I got through the pandemic with my uh, career change, but that was a tough two years. And I just find nowadays, uh, like you said, it's just people go on social media and they see how other people are doing well. Then they start feeling sorry, kind of feeling bad about their lives as well. Yeah. Leads to my next question, uh, Mia. Can you just tell us about your uh, your public speaking at the Congressional Hispanic Caucus? And I believe uh, former President Barack Obama was there as well. 
Yeah, I was invited to speak numerous times in Washington on mental health, and it's uh, great memories that I have being involved with that. I was involved with Congresswoman Napolitano and um, went to Washington on her behalf many times, and it was a great experience. Do you feel the government right now is doing enough for mental health, or do you think there's still a lot of work to be done? There's definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, we're going to continue to have shootings if we don't start focusing on mental health, you know, and because um, if you look at the shooters, many of them had mental illness and it went undetected. Because I, I could speak for being from Canada, uh, a lot of the programs here were cut by the government, and and we're seeing more of it here. And um, obviously, homelessness is a, as well. And uh, it would be nice for somebody. It's it's people like yourself that are fighting, and we could use more people like yourself to fight 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 this and and help out this battle. Yeah, I think the key is to become educated. How many people do you know can tell you what is schizophrenia? Probably what is not. It, what does it look like? I mean, <laughs> the average person has no idea and that's a shame. That's sad. And that leads to this question, Mia, how important is education and how has your life experience helped you with speaking with students in school? Well, education is very important. And that's something that I think we lack here in the United States. Um, it should be a requirement. <laughs> Mental health 101 should be a requirement. Absolutely. I have a, a video clip off of your website. Uh, it's about a two-minute um, video from uh, TMZ Sports. Is it okay if I play the two-minute clip? You're speaking sure. about mental health. Okay, thank you so much, Mia. And uh, everybody watching, please subscribe to her YouTube channel and check out her website as well. And just one second. Let me know if you can hear the audio okay. So you're here today to talk to the Mental Health Commission. Right. I want to expose our mental health system in L.A. County, which I believe, in my opinion, is probably one of the worst mental health systems in the country. And it doesn't take much for a person to see that. All you have to do is go down Skid Row and look at all of our homeless people right. that live there. And the majority of them are suffering from mental health issues. Okay. And I, I, know, that, I know this is uh, dear to your heart, you're a big proponent of it. What, what can we change? Like, what do you want there to be done? Well, first of all, look, we need to start spending more money on research and how to help these people who are suffering from mental illness. Um, my son um, lost his life in, in an L.A. County mental health facility. And, and this is due to negligence, negligence, falsifying records. They, they, don't, they don't give these people any kind of love or attention. Um, they're, not, they're not properly cared for. It's just, it's disgusting. And, and this is 2017. And this is what we still see today, like psychiatric facilities that, that we saw back in, in the 60s and 70s, right. you know, barbaric. People ask me all the time, like, am I retired? I am not retired. I am still fighting. And I'm going to fight the system to the day I die or till I see change, till I see reform. My son died as a result of L.A. County's neglect. Right. And very sorry. many other thank you and many other children and i'm not going to let this continue just thoughts on that uh thoughts on that uh, uh mia doing that video with tm sports and what was it like being announced by cnn is their mental health house warrior um i was very proud of that because i hope that i'm doing my son justice and uh, 
Can you tell us a little bit about your late son's personal art studio, Stone Art, and now it is a, a free center for young adults suffering from mental illness, homelessness, and addiction? And how can people who are watching or listening today can uh, help out with this? Well, they can go to miasaintjohnfoundation.org, and we can always use help. Um, I find that art is a great way to express yourself. If my son didn't have the words to express himself, but he did so in his paintings. And um, I was going to ask also, oh, with your foundation, can people also volunteer their time as well? Um, right now, we're not, we don't have uh, volunteers, um, but they can always go to support us in the foundation and and make a donation since you were kind enough to come on my show today i will be happy to go on your website and make a donation because uh it mental health affects a lot of people it's not just one or two it affects a lot of us around the world wherever you're living yes it does it, it affects um I believe the statistic is is one in four for mental illness. But how many of us suffer from depression and anxiety? I mean, I think we all know someone who suffers. <laughs> yes, and, and I've known two people, two friends of mine, who a couple years ago tried to uh, commit suicide. But thankfully, uh, they, they were saved and they got the help they needed. And they're doing okay now. Yeah. Um, before we wrap this up, any other advice you would give to somebody, uh, like I said, with mental health nowadays? Um, to seek treatment. Um, we, we've evolved with our medications, and there are some very good psychiatrists out there that know their medications. And for me, medication is key. Um, and I have a very good psychiatrist. Uh, thank God. <laughs> It really does help to talk to somebody too. And, and we mentioned this before listening to people too. Sometimes just somebody having someone to listen to really helps as well. Yes, definitely have a good psychologist. But and definitely a psychiatrist too. The, I have so much respect for people in that industry. Yeah, so do I. Absolutely. And before we wrap this up, I do this with all my guests. What's a, a fun fact about Mia St. John's that your fans might not know about? Oh, they definitely don't know that I'm a doll collector. I collect dolls. <laughs> okay, I had no idea. So I'm, I'm assuming yeah. you saw the Barbie movie that came out? Yes, I did. And uh, how many dolls do you have and what's your favorite one? Oh, Gosh, I have too many to count, and my favorite are the antiques. Okay, the antiques. And uh, as for music, uh, what what kind of music do you like these days? I love, I've always been a fan of folk music. You know, Jackson Brown, Bob Dylan, um, Arlo Guthrie, uh, Joan Baez. Um, Judy Collins, you know, I, uh, I, I just love folk music. And music also can uh, impact our mental health as well. Cause if you listen to music, it can, uh, trigger emotions and it can change your mood as well. So, um, I don't have any musical talent, but I like listening to the classic rock from the seventies, eighties and nineties. And now today's country music as well. Yeah. And uh, finally, out of all the boxers in the world, I guess the Muhammad Ali, Muhammad Ali is the greatest, but who would you rank right behind him for the greatest boxers in the world, male and female? Floyd Mayweather. Okay, and uh, finally, we'll wrap this up. Mia, where can my audience, again, follow you on social media and your website and I guess the best way to purchase this book would be through what Amazon.com or Amazon.ca yeah. here in Canada. Yeah. And you can follow me on Twitter at Mia St. John Boxer or Instagram at Mia St. John Boxer. And uh, what is your latest, uh, what are your next projects coming up to for my audience? I have a 
documentary coming out um, that uh, is being produced by a company in the UK. And I'll let everyone know when that when that comes out. Sounds great. But hey, Mia, I want to say thank you so much again for giving me some time out of your busy schedule. I really appreciate uh, talking to you today. And uh, I'll be happy to make an online, online donation to your charity work as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mia. And I will send you an audio and video copy of our show later on, which will be on radio stations here in Canada and Georgia very soon. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Thanks, Mia. Take care. Bye. Bye. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed season eight, episode five today of Live with CDP Sports Talk with my special guest, Mia St. John, a five time women's world boxing champion as well. And before we go, guys, I am going to play another clip. Uh, I'm just going to play another clip one second of uh, Mia St. John. Because uh, she does a lot of work with mental health uh, stuff. And uh, I'm just going to just try to find the video here. One second. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to keep talking. Uh, right now, uh, my next ep- next live with CDP Sports Talk, guys, to be announced. I'm hoping to do one Friday. But I am working on more shows as well. And um, one second. I'm going to see if I can uh, get this back on here. I want to just play one more uh, video from uh, Mia St. John about the importance of mental health. And uh, I want to say thank you for her, for, for her coming on here again today. And uh, we'll just see if we can get this on this other video. One sec, bear, bear with me guys. This is, this video is from her YouTube channel and it's courtesy of Mia St. John foundation.org. And I'm going to play this one second. When I'm in the ring, I have no anger towards my opponent. The only person that knows what I'm feeling and can feel my pain and my fear is the person standing across from me. But as much of a connection as I feel for her, there's still the dysfunction in me that says I'm going to win at any cost. Whether it be my life, your life, I'm going to win. I was about three or four when I first felt that something was different about me. We were living in uh, Arizona and one of the kids in the apartment complex was about to do this, some jump on a bicycle. And so the whole neighborhood was about to go watch. Something in my brain just kept saying, no, go to the other side of the, the street. That'll be better. That'll be better. And so I went right over to the other side of the street. And then my brain said, no, go to the other side. The other side is better. And my brain just kept going back and forth, back and forth. So I kept running back and forth until finally I was hit by a car and the bike at the same time. And that would kind of set the tone for the rest of my life. When I was six years old, my dad put me in Taekwondo because he was in love with the martial arts. I had a kind of dysfunctional father. He really forced me into the sport and I just did it because I had to. I didn't really love it until I became an adult. And that's when I really started competing was after I got sober. My father was an alcoholic and I wanted to see what he loved so much about alcohol, what it did for him. I just wanted to, I was curious. And so one night when they weren't home, I broke into the liquor cabinet and um, took my first drink. It was an instant addiction. One of my lowest points would be after I overdosed and I was about 13 years old. That's probably the time when I felt that something was seriously going wrong. My mother had me in and out of doctors to try and figure out what was going on. I'd be walking through the school halls and Things were moving, shifting about, and I couldn't tell, I couldn't distinguish between what was real and what wasn't. I was experiencing depersonalization where I couldn't, I had no connection to myself and I had no connection to to reality. So it was almost like I was living in this dream world and it was, it felt like a prison. 
Every day I tried to wake up and I couldn't, and nobody knew what was wrong. I got to a point in my drinking and using where I felt like I just didn't want to live anymore. And I remember I was in the car and I was loaded and I stopped at a payphone to call my dad and he just said that he couldn't, but I could always go home. I got so angry, I hung up the phone and I backed up my truck and crashed into the payphone. I felt so, so alone and so abandoned by everyone, by society, by my family, and rightfully so, because they could no longer enable me. Um, but I felt alone until I finally went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, and at that point, I had felt like either I was going to die, and I was, I wanted to die, but I was almost, I was too afraid to die. I, I still had a little bit of self-preservation left in me. And so I chose to go get help. Sobriety was probably one of the best things that ever happened to me, but it was only a small piece of the puzzle. It was a huge piece of the puzzle, but there was still my mental health issues. I've been diagnosed with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, GAD, generalized anxiety disorder. I try not to focus on the label. I almost use it to work for me in my life and not against me. I graduated college in 1994, and at the time I was competing in Taekwondo. So I was going back and forth from tournaments to school and trying to graduate. And then I got a divorce, I had two little kids. So it all came to a head and the stress I just couldn't take anymore. So I had a relapse and I started going in and out of reality once again. I started um, with the obsessive compulsiveness once again and that turned into an eating disorder. So while I was sober, I wasn't using drugs or alcohol, I was still finding ways to self-medicate. When my ex-husband came to check on me, he found me in the bathroom with the door locked. He got me out and he took me to a hospital. And within 72 hours, my whole life had changed. It was a miracle. Medication, I really believe, saved my life. I slowly realized when I got out of the hospital that it was about how I was going to lead my daily life. And luckily, I was already a fighter, so I was already exercising and working out daily. I had to lead a very structured life. I had to wake up in the morning and do the same thing every single day. And if I got even thrown off a little, it could set me back into a relapse. Fighting for me was, was a great outlet for all my dysfunctions. I really fell in love with the sport and started competing. And then at the age of 28, I decided I really have to start making a living. I wanted to do something that, that I was passionate about, that I loved. And I knew fighting was something I loved more than anything in the world. Because I always used to dream about being a fighter. It was since I was a kid, I, I would envision myself walking through the tunnel to the ring and with my hands held up high and I always saw that and so I felt like well if my mind sees it and believes it then then what's the difference when you take that walk from the dressing room through the tunnel to the ring you know that you could die in the ring you have to be willing to not only give up your own life but take the life of another person and that has to be okay when we're about to knock someone out and we're punching them and beating on them, there's nothing in our head that says, oh, stop, back up. You might render this human being unconscious and that person might die or suffer serious brain damage. No, your brain is telling you, go, go, go until that person is down. I don't believe I was put on this earth to beat and destroy another human being. That wasn't my purpose. I had something much greater in life to do. I founded the El Saber Es Poder Foundation, which means knowledge is power. And we help educate Latinos in this country and in Mexico 
that was my true destiny in life. Boxing was just a vehicle to take me to my, my true destiny. This is what's significant in life. No matter what you have, um, or what obstacle you have to overcome, it's possible. I mean, anything is possible. And, and that you should never, ever give up hope. Because if I didn't have that, the hope that, that one day I would be better and, and one day I would be a success, if I didn't have that to hang on to, I, I don't know where I would be. The message that I try to give kids now is that no matter what anybody says, only you have the power to change your life. And I want them to know that there's nothing to be ashamed of because there's so many people that suffer from these illnesses. I don't even like to call them illnesses because to me, it was, it was a gift. If I had the choice to give up my, my disorder or my illness, would I? No, because it's given me so much and it made me who I am today and it's given me everything that I have today. And so I would rather be like this than not. That clip was courtesy of Mia St. John Foundation.org. So you guys can check out and donate to her foundation through Mia St. John Foundation.org. I got it down here on the graphic. And also, guys, you can follow Mia St. John on Twitter, X at Mia St. John Boxer on Twitter. And her official website is Mia St. John.com. As well. And again, I want to say thank you to Mia St. John, a five time women's boxing world champion, a mental health advocate, and the author, author of her current book, Fighting for My Life, a memoir about a mother's loss and grief, is now available. And you can get it on websites such as Amazon.com in the States. And I would assume it would be on Amazon.ca here in Canada. I want to say thank you to Mia St. John again, talking to us about her boxing career, about the importance of mental health, and uh, just learning a little bit more about her and her uh, latest book again. So please check out her book, A Memoir About a Mother's Loss in Grief, uh, which she just wrote recently. And she also wrote another book um, uh, about 10 years ago uh, called... I'm just trying to re remember what the book was called. Uh, I will have it on here in a second. The Knockout Workout. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, before she retired, she uh, wrote another book called The Knockout Workout, uh, which is uh, available in stores nationwide about the importance of uh, fitness and mental health and overcoming hardships and female empowerment as well. So again, thank you to Mia St. John uh, for giving us some time out of her busy schedule to come on live with CDP Sports Talk, which is on weeknights from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. on CKRT, Border City Radio in Windsor, and WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. Also, guys, just before we wrap up our next show, um, I'm going to make an announcement in a few days when my next show is. So stay tuned to my social media pages for updates on my next show and my next guest. And as always, Live with CDP Sports Talk is available on CKRT, Border City Radio in Windsor from weeknights from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Check out our radio station's website at CKRTBorderCityRadio.com. Calm. I have an announcement to make this morning as well. I just received an email this morning from the NFL Communications Department. I was approved for a media pass for the 24, 2024 NFL Draft in Detroit. So fingers crossed I can get a hotel room down in the Detroit, Windsor area, and I will be able to do some media work and coverage of this year's NFL Draft that will be place, taking place in the city of Detroit. And I want to say thank you to the National Football League uh, Media Community Communications Department for giving me this opportunity. Who thought four years ago the self-taught, self-made man would be getting an opportunity to cover an event such as the NFL draft. And I'm really wanted to share this news with you guys all here on live with CDP sports talk this morning. 
Also, guys, uh, check out the Cambridge and District Humane Society at 1650 Dunbar Row in Cambridge, Ontario, 519-623-7722, or visit their website at cambridgehumanesociety.org. That's cambridgehumanesociety.org. You can see all their pets up for adoption. And if you're in the Cambridge, Kitchell, Arlu, Guelph area and looking for forever friend, check out the Cambridge District Humane Society again. And I do some volunteer work with them once or twice a week, walking dogs. And one of the, my favorite dogs down there is Clifford. So check them out on their website. All their information is there. And they're doing a once a month 50-50 raffle to support the Cambridge District Humane Society. You can get your tickets again on their website at cambridgehumanesociety.org or give them a call at 519-623-7722. By the way, this past weekend I was in Buffalo and I stayed at the Best Western Hotel, the Best Western Summit on Niagara Falls Boulevard in Niagara Falls, New York. So if you're looking for a good location, a good hotel, reasonably priced, good breakfast, a really nice indoor swimming pool, and a, a nice fitness center as well. Check out the Best Western at the Summit in Niagara Falls, New York, and uh, see their, one of their managers, uh, Lisa, as well. But uh, that's where I stay now in Niagara Falls, New York, is at the Best Western. Check them out. And also, Check out, if you need gas in the area, check out Marathon uh, on Niagara Falls Boulevard there as well. The gentleman that runs the, the Marathon there, his name is Sam. Great customer service. And uh, their gas is pretty uh, cheap compared to Canada where it's uh, what, $1.63 a liter right now. In the States, it's uh, three thirty one dollars a gallon over in Western New York as well. Also, guys, live with CDP Sports Talk, a weekly sports and entertainment talk show hosted by yours truly, Chris Palme, is also on weeknights at 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern on radio station WQEE 99.1 FM, the key, the home of Southern sports and talk, the heartbeat of Atlanta. Our radio station's website is wqeefm.radio1234.com. And a shout out to the station manager, Ryan O'Neill, and also Donna Tuckwell, the station manager and owner of CKRT in Windsor. Live with CDP Sports Talk, again, is live streamed on these platforms. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, slash X, Twitch, LinkedIn, and now available on Instagram. Remember to follow me on Instagram, Chris Pome on Instagram. And also, guys, I'm on Cameo. Check out Cameo.com. Type in my name, Chris Palme, and book a personalized video message for me. Uh, birthday wishes, pep talk, um, ask me a question, um, my opinion on sports or about my radio work, media work. And the proceeds from my cameo video will go to my radio show and my media work. So again, check out Chris Palme on cameo.com for your personal video today. Also, I want to say thank you to my 306 subscribers on YouTube. Just two years ago, I had maybe 60 subscribers. So I want to say thank you to 306 people for subscribing to my YouTube channel. And if you haven't subscribed yet, type in my name, Chris Palme, live with CDP Sports Talk. Hit that subscribe notification and like notifications as well. And a lot of my media work, all of it is on my YouTube channel. So check out my interviews with Casey Candell, the manager of the Buffalo Bison, John Tavares, the head coach of the Buffalo Bandits. And I also was able to speak to four Toronto Blue Jays this weekend down in Buffalo for rehab assignments in catcher Danny Jansen, pitchers Alex Manoa, pitcher Jordan Romero, who's their reliever, and Eric Swanson as well. And I also interviewed uh, Cam Eden, who was up with the Blue Jays last year. Uh, he's one of the nicest guys. And uh, please let me know what you think of my uh, live interviews I do and all my media work there. So check me out on YouTube. And I'm also on all social media platforms except for Snapchat. Uh, and, and also I'm on YouTube, I'm on TikTok at live with cdp so make sure if you haven't followed me on tiktok yet at live with cdp and you'll see a lot of content there tiktok has actually been a very useful tool uh for my new career into the radio and media industry as well it's really helped me uh, learn how to cut promo promos for myself for my guests and my media work and i post all my interviews there as well 
Also, I have a website, by the way, uh, beacons.ai slash Chris D. Palme, if you'd like to check it out. Live with CDP Sports Talk, again, is brought to you by Barry Cullen Chevrolet Dealership here in Guelph at 905 Woodlawn Road West in the Guelph Auto Mall. Check out barrycullen.com for the newest selection of new and pre-owned GM vehicles or give them a call at 519-824-0210 or email them at info at barrycullen.com. Speaking of Barry Cullen Chevrolet right now, it's truck months at Barry Cullen Chevrolet. 2024 Silverado, 0% financing for up to 60 months. More details at barrycullen.com. StreamYard is the official live stream provider of Live with CDP Sports Talk. If you're into webinars or podcasting such as yours truly, check out StreamYard.com. And also, guys, they have plans. They have a free basic plan, which is zero per month. Or you can get a basic plan through StreamYard.com for $25 a month. Or you can get the professional plan for $49 a month that I have. And if you're a business that does a lot of webinars or live streaming for your business, Check out StreamYard.com and contact the sales department. I've been a customer of StreamYard.com for three and a half years, and I find it's the number one live streaming service out there. Live with CDP Sports Talk, the audio version is on the available on these platforms. iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Spotify for Podcasters, Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, Spotify, Castbox, LinkedIn, Pandora, and tuned in. Finally, guys, you can email or text live with CDP Sports Talk at cpalme19 at gmail.com or you can text the show at 519 820 7188. Any comments, questions, suggestions, feedback, good or bad, would be greatly appreciated. And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live stream today on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, slash X, and Instagram as well. And again, my next live with CDP Sports Talk to be announced. I'm hoping to have one this week coming up, maybe Friday or Saturday, and I'm working on more uh, great guests as well. And again, for those who are just coming on now, I got an email this morning from the NFL community, the NFL community communications department, and I've been approved for um, an NFL media pass for the uh, 2024 NFL draft in Detroit. So fingers crossed, I can find a hotel room in the Detroit Windsor area, and and I will be able to do some interviews and some media work uh, covering the uh, 2024 NFL draft, which takes place April 27th to 29th in downtown Detroit. By the way, guys, the Detroit Red Wings last night, 5-4 exciting overtime win over the uh, Montreal Canadiens. So the Red Wings are still alive for a playoff spot. They play their final regular season game, hopefully not their last game of the year, tonight at Montreal. If the Red Wings can get a win and get two points and the Washington Capitals are defeated by the Philadelphia Flyers, the Red Wings will be in the playoffs for the first time since 2016. And if, if unfortunately, if Washington wins and Detroit wins, the Wings will be eliminated. So we need the Flyers to beat the Capitals, and the Red Wings need to take care of the Capitals. But Lucas Raymond is an elite player. Regardless if the player, the Red Wings make the playoffs or not, uh, this team is on the way up. Steve Eiserman in five years has got this team on the verge of playoff contention. We'll see if they get in tonight or not. But uh, players like Mo Sider on defense, Lucas Raymond, Dylan Larkin, the additions of Alex DeBrincat, Patrick Kane uh, have really helped this organization. And the Red Wings are very close to being a playoff team. And who knows, after tonight they might be. And if they do get in the playoffs, the Red Wings, they'll be taking on those New York Rangers this Sunday at Madison Square Garden. Hopefully, fingers crossed. As for the Detroit Tigers, after a 4-0 start, uh, they have now lost Five or sorry, the Tigers after their four and all start have lost uh, seven out of their last 12 games. The Tigers are now nine and seven, which is still not bad for April. Uh, the Tigers are coming off a one nothing loss at home yesterday to the world champion Texas Rangers at Comerica Park. The Tigers take on Texas today at 110 first pitch on Belly Sports Detroit and on 97 won the ticket as well. And that's about it, guys. Uh, I want to say thank you again to my guest today, Mia St. John, a five-time women's world champion boxer for coming on here today. 
And uh, I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live streamed and also on audio platforms and for listening on WQEE 99.1 FM in Georgia and on CKRT Border City Radio in Windsor. I hope everybody has a great day, great rest of the week, and hopefully we'll be back uh, this Friday possibly for another edition of Live with CDP Sports Talk or Season to episode four of the Small Talk Podcast with my co-host Marlene Sharp. So stay tuned. Uh, that's about it for today. So guys, enjoy the NHL games tonight and enjoy Major League Baseball. And speaking of baseball, the Buffalo Bisons are on a six-game road trip to Columbus this week, taking on Columbus tonight, uh, 6-15. And you can watch that game on MLB TV or... Or you can listen to the Bisons game on the bet 1520 in Buffalo with Pat Malacaro. And again, thank you to the Buffalo Bisons, Buffalo Bandits organizations for having me there this weekend, covering their teams as freelance media. And again, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel and also my TikTok page, as well as follow me on Twitter slash X at Chris D. Pome. And I'm also on Facebook as well. I hope everybody has a great day. Great week, and we'll talk to you guys very soon for more editions of Live with CDP Sports Talk. And again, my news today is I am going to the be at the NFL Draft this year in Detroit. Uh, fingers crossed I can find a hotel. And again, I'm, I'm really excited for that opportunity as well. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching and listening to Live with CDP Sports Talk. Again, brought to you by Barry Cullen Chevrolet Dealership here in Guelph. We'll